of course, we have our very own president and CEO, Derek Johnson. Also, Congressman Bobby Scott from the great state of Virginia. Bobby Scott presently serves as Congress Education and Labor Chair. He was once an NACP uh, branch president of the Newport News, where my family is, Newport News branch in Virginia. And he is a dear friend to labor, Roxanne Brown. Roxanne is a new um, international vice president for the United Steelworkers, a great lobbyist and political strategist um, for not just the steelworkers, for all of labor. Ryan Boya, Ryan, he is the uh, African-American caucus president and special international representative of the Labor's International Union of North America and our very own Dr. Bill Spriggs, who is with us often. He is the chair uh, economist of the AFL-CIO and a good friend to the NACP. Leading this conversation tonight is my friend and one of my mentors, Mr. Bill Fletcher. Bill Fletcher has been an activist since his teen years. After graduating from college, he went on to be a, a welder in the shipyard. And therefore, it was his entry into the labor movement. Over the years, um, Bill Fletcher has become a great strategist for union organizing, also for political um, organizing, um, not just here in the United States, but globally. Bill Fletcher, is a, a commentator. He's also a author of many books. And I would uh, just encourage you to read a few. The Indispensable Ally, Black Workers and the Formation of, of the Congress of, Inter of Industrial Organizations. That's the CIO of the AFL. He's also the co-author author of Solidarity Divided the crisis in organized labor and new path towards social justice. I wanna turn this over to tonight's moderator. Um, at the end of our conversation, we will open it up for Q&A. And then the last voice you will hear tonight is our very own international president of the United Auto Workers, national board member of the NACP, and my labor co-chair, Ray Carey. Thank you. Bill. Robin, uh, greetings. First of all, thank you, Robin, for the introduction. Uh, greetings to members and supporters of the NAACP and those that are following this program. Uh, my name is Bill Fletcher, as Robin said, and I have the honor and the opportunity to be the host of tonight's discussion. So let me just lay out a little bit about the format, then we're just gonna jump right in. Uh, this is gonna be like a talk show. And many of us are used to, you know, one person after another speaking, yang, 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 yang. And during which time we go off into our email or put the, 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 the computer on uh, silent and watch some television. Uh, you're not gonna be able to do that tonight because this is gonna be really interesting. And so we have some questions for our panelists and a discussion that we're hoping will uh, generate many new ideas as well as um, uh, questions from you. So we encourage you to go to the Q&A portion, which is in the bottom part of your screen, uh, where, where it says Q&A, no surprise there. And you can put your questions in that you might want asked of the panelists. Uh, you may want to ask something directly to one person uh, you may want to ask uh, to the, the panel as a whole, and, and we will do our best, we promise you that, to get to your questions, but we can't guarantee it because time constraints. Uh, let me just say a couple of things to, to get us uh, going. Let's be clear, Black workers were central to the development of the U.S. economy. Uh, were it not for Black indentured servants and Black slaves uh, brought over here, forced to come over to uh, North America, what eventually became the United States, 
the United States economy would never have been pushed into the uh, 19th century. It would not have been a major source for the production of cotton, tobacco, and, and many other things. It was black workers that were central to that. With, with the Civil War and the end of slavery, black workers were uh, essentially uh, dispensed with, sort of, right? There was no compensation offered for the centuries of slavery. And, and then we were returned to a semi-slavery existence under uh, Jim Crow. Black workers continue to be central in the US economy, however, and at key moments, such as during World War I, during World War II, uh, and in the 1960s, you see a very central role of the black worker in transforming the US economy. Yet we get no credit for that. And when we're no longer needed, we're dispensed with. And so in the 1980s, when you started to see this transformation of global capitalism, something that was called neoliberalism, what I think of as capitalist fundamentalism, this hit us hardest. African-Americans, Chicanos, Puerto Ricans, who were very central in manufacturing, were dispensed with. We started to see the ravaging of our cities. We were the ones, not Trump supporters. It was us who were suffering as neoliberalism advanced. And nobody paid attention because it was just us. Well, the question is, are we at a moment where some of this can be turned around? And that's what we want to ask our distinguished panel tonight. You know, can this actually be turned around? And is this opportunity being offered to us by the program that's being advanced by the Biden administration? So I want to begin by asking a question to all of the panelists, although I'm going to ask President Johnson to begin in addressing this. And it's based on something that my parents used to say to me when I, when I was growing up. And they were, they were people that grew up during the Depression and World War II. And they would say, Bill, you know, one of the things that happened during the Depression is that like everybody was suffering. We were suffering particularly, but everyone was suffering. And in that context, a lot of whites said, let's join together and fight back and fight for everybody. And so we did. And then when the U.S. came out of the Depression, largely because of World War II, and then what happened after World War II, uh, Black workers were often abandoned. And, and I guess I want to ask, what's going to be different this time? And, and what does this, what do we, how do we look at this uh, building back better as not just a cheap promise? What needs, to, what needs to be done differently? You know that saying, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. How do we not get chumped? President Johnson. Could you start long, with this? Long, long question. I hope I can have a, a short answer. First of all, thank you all for joining us tonight and all of you who are watching this virtually and all of you who will watch the recording of this. Uh, uh, Black labor and civil rights movement, there is no distinction, there is no separation. Understanding that uh, for the Africans that were brought here, we were brought here for the uh, exploitation of our labor. Uh, once we were able to fight and gain our freedom, with the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, the three primary issues that were really driving uh, our energies. One, our ability to negotiate for our labor. That's key. Uh, two, our ability to fully engage and leverage our franchise to have a voice in the formation of public policy. That's two. And then thirdly, looking at the future, the ability to afford our children with a quality education. That's, that has always been the foundation of a civil rights movement with the franchise, access to education, critical thinking, and the ability to determine how our labor would be used. Collective bargaining is a part of that. You know, if you look at some of the foundings of some of our unions, particularly the Teamsters, those dock workers in New Orleans, those are African-American workers who had come together to form what ultimately became the Teamsters. In the city of Detroit, many people migrated north from, like my family, from Alabama or Tennessee uh, areas because they were union jobs with the UAW. They did the same thing 
uh, coming out of the, uh, Georgia and other parts of Alabama to go to Pittsburgh for the steel workers and out of the Carolinas to, to New York because those were jobs where our labor could be valued and we could earn a quality of life. So there is no separation. But as you look at this current package, I don't think the three things I mentioned before is any difference. One, the question of quality education. What we are finding ourselves in the midst of is a student loan debt crisis that must be resolved. You can provide people with really good work, but if they are in a cycle of debt, particularly student loan debt, that they cannot discharge a bankruptcy and it, it, it follows African-Americans far longer than others, we have to address that. That's not in the package. I want to be clear, but the administration have the ability to address that in two key ways. One, the, the number one workforce for African-Americans is in government. There's a program that's already in place, Public Student Loan Forgiveness Program. The regs need to be revised so African-Americans who are overly indexing and in, in, as public sector workers can get some relief. But the current um, uh, 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 program is not open enough to allow people to participate. Even with Build Back Better, you have to address that. With Build Back Better, to make sure that the jobs that come out are not jobs that large corporations or contractors are able to build the bridges, the roads, and still eliminate opportunity for African-Americans. That's gonna be extremely important, but that's only gonna be, at, we can only be as effective at that because when the money finally is agreed upon and, 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 and sit in the house, come together with the final decision, a lot of this money is gonna be pushed down to local jurisdictions. And it's gonna happen in the midst of an election cycle where our franchise is being threatened in ways in which none of us would have imagined just 10 short years ago, just five years ago. And if we are unable to influence the formation of public policy, when these federal dollars come in, if the right parameters are not in place, we will be left behind because some of these industries won't pay prevailing wage, they won't pay living wage because they're gonna be looking for a profit opportunity, not a people empowerment opportunity. I appreciate that, President Johnson. Uh, Congressman Scott, how would you answer the same question? I think you need to look at um, what we've done and what we're trying to do. If you look back at the rescue plan, you can see some of the success we've had already this year. Uh, elections have consequences. Um, uh, Joe Biden was elected and we were elected two Democratic senators from Georgia that gave us at least um, um, procedural control of the, um, of, of, of the US Senate and allowed us to pass the American Rescue Plan, which had many provisions, including the child tax credit, um, improved the earned income tax credit, $1,400 checks. When you add up all of what we did, child poverty went down 50%. Put that in perspective, uh, the biggest drop in child poverty and since they've been calculating it, the biggest drop in one year is 20%. We dropped 50% in one year. In the black community, 34% drop in black poverty uh, in, 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 in one year. We improved healthcare. We had massive investments in education and distributed the unprecedented amount of federal money by the Title I formula, which is primarily based on poverty. So the low income areas got the most money. We saved about a million people's pensions. Um, if you look back over the last 12 months, unprecedented money went to historically black colleges and universities. And so I think if you look at what we've done so far, uh, it shows that we have, uh, we're in the right focus. Going forward, we have essentially two bills, the Roads and Bridges Plan and the Build Back Better uh, Plan. And the, if we can pass um, those and essentially the shape they're in now, they will be transformative because it uh, provides uh, all kinds of things that not only will create the jobs, but will allow people to get the jobs. Massive uh, amounts of money for job training, uh, money for uh, community colleges so that you can uh, get your, uh, uh, get training. Um, jobs like uh, training, like apprenticeship programs, unions are very much involved. Um, uh, things like childcare, the massive investment in childcare and early childhood education. If you have young children and can't afford childcare, you can't go to work. Um, 
uh, so the massive uh, investments in child care and early childhood education, which will provide the daycare so people can uh, go to work, but also will get young people off on the right track uh, so that uh, they will be uh, much better educated and on, on the right on, on the right track. We improve child nutrition services. And so I think um, uh, if you look at uh, what is in the bill, and we don't know if we can pass it. You, you, everybody's been uh, following the news. We may not have the votes, but if we pass this, uh, it will be transformational in terms of people's ability uh, to get work. And specifically in terms of uh, civil rights enforcement, uh, significant new investments in the EEOC and the Office of uh, Federal Contracts Co Co Compliance Program, OFCCP, uh, to make sure that um, the civil rights laws are being enforced. So there's a lot in this bill for, for everybody. If we can do uh, the kind of things that we did in the last bill in terms of uh, alleviating uh, poverty, uh, we'll go a long way in, um, in, in, in improving a lot of, of African Americans. And I'd, I'd just like to say one uh, additional word, um, there are provisions in there to, to strengthen labor laws to uh, help people um, uh, join unions. Uh, if you can get into a union, you get more money, you get better working conditions, um, you get better benefits, including a pension, which is a huge asset. People talk about um, uh, the, the wealth disparity. Well, in a union contract, there's no difference in pay between blacks and whites and men and women. Uh, you get equal pay for equal work, you get more money, and you're more likely to get a pension, which is a huge asset uh, to come into to, to a family. So uh, we've got a lot of um, uh, potential, uh, but like I said, we're not sure we can uh, we can pass the bill. We need uh, uh, we need support, and if we can pass it, it will be transformational in terms of people's ability to go to work. And we're going to be talking about how it gets passed because we realize it's not going to happen based on magic. And so I appreciate everything that you were just saying. Like, let, well, me just not, let me tell you, he's not the only one. I mean, yeah. I'm talking about the house. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Okay. Um, one more uh, on the same question, Vice President Brown, if you want to uh, offer your insight in terms of that question, and then we're going to move to another one. Thanks so much, Bill. I really appreciate it. I was going to jump in if you didn't ask, so thank you. Um, on the human infrastructure bill that, that Congressman Scott just mentioned, that $3.5 trillion bill, to, to, to Dr. President Johnson's point, um, there are some really key educational pieces built into that bill. And so to Congressman Scott's point, we got to get it done. There's money for free community college tuition, there is increased funding for Pell Grants, not, not loans, but Pell Grants. Um, and, you know, in addition to the, the uh, child care piece that Congressman Scott mentioned, um, there's also money for uh, HBCUs. So it adds to the money that has already been spent during this pandemic to provide additional funding for HBCUs. So that's a really key bill. On the physical infrastructure side, the $1.2 trillion package, um, you know, there's a ton of new spending. We already talked about the $550 billion of new spending that's in there. But when you really drill down, there's tremendous opportunity to direct that spending to our communities. We talk so much about Flint, right? When we think about water, we talk about Flint, but there's so many communities around this country that really need targeted, directed investment. There's about $55 billion of money in that $1.2 trillion package to make upgrades to our water systems. We just have been through this whole period where kids have been home you know, with their parents, parents trying to figure out school. So many children in communities across this country could not access the internet. We're all on the internet right now. We're doing this Zoom call. So many kids across this country could not access internet. There's $65 billion in this bill, that $1.2 trillion bill for broadband. There's about $14 billion in that bill that would allow internet to be more affordable for our communities. So when we're talking about you know, making these policies um, do what they need to do for our communities, the education piece is key but also directing that new money, that $550 billion of new money to communities that have been 
ignored uh, for, for so long and, and who really, really need that direct investment. So there's tremendous opportunity. I keep hearing the word opportunity. There's so much opportunity, um, but we have to get it done. And I think, you know, in, in terms of how we make sure that this happens, we keep the pressure on. We have our friend, Congressman Scott, on this call, but we have to keep the pressure on to so many different lawmakers to try to get this done. Our union is doing our part. We're really, you know, um, we've taken our message to the streets with our We Supply America campaign, but there's so much that we need to do to get both of these bills across the finish line. Thank you. Dr. Spriggs, um, you know, we hear a lot from the Republicans and even some Democrats like West Virginia Senator Munchkin that, uh, that this is like a lot of money that's being talked about, that it's going to uh, uh, push uh, inflation. Uh, give us some context. I mean, why, why does this make sense at this point? I mean, isn't it, isn't it just like a pipe dream? No, it's not a pipe dream. We have to think about this being a new century and we haven't acted that way in this century. In the middle of the 20th century, our nation made huge investments for the infrastructure that we've been coasting on, but that infrastructure is the infrastructure of the last century. This is the current century. So just think about what we did. In the middle of the 20th century, we built an interstate highway system. In the middle of the 20th century, half the college students in the United States were in college for free in 1946. Not disproportionately black, disproportionately white, but half the college students in the United States were at the best colleges in the United States, not community college, not teacher colleges, they were concentrated in the top universities going there free. And we doubled down our investment on infrastructure in our universities to produce science and technology and to produce public school teachers. That was the 20th century. In this century, we lost over 4 million manufacturing jobs. We gained 4 million low-wage restaurant jobs. Clearly, we went in the wrong direction. When we started this pandemic recession, we had 12 million restaurant workers. We had 12 million manufacturing workers. That's not the right direction. And so we have to correct course. You can't continue to eat the investment that was made before. You can't eat your corn seed. You got to plant and make new investments, and you have to make new investments for this century and proportionate to our economy and proportionate to the need. That means you have to have high speed infrastructure. Everybody has to have the internet highway of the 21st century, not the 20th century highway. We have to have mass transit that protects greenhouse gas emissions, that provides a way for workers to get to work. More black workers depend on public transit than other workers. Black workers in the rural South don't have access to public transportation. We have to have an investment in HBCUs who were passed over in the 20th century so that technology and technology development will happen everywhere, and you have to invest in anti-discrimination. And the investments we made in the middle of the 20th century, these were heavily favoring white workers. This century, we cannot repeat that mistake. The most important part of this is to increase our investment for enforcement in the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, and in the EEOC, the, there's a piece of legislation called the Vietnam Era Veterans Reemployment Act that requires all contractors to publicly post jobs. You hear all these employers saying, I post a job, but you know, nobody comes. They don't post it publicly. They don't post it in a website that everybody has access to. 
VEVRA requires that they do that. If you fully fund the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, they can make sure that when a contract goes out, the job is posted publicly, everybody gets access to that information. There are no secret doors as there are in the labor market today. And having the enforcement at the beginning, at the pre-bid conference, to lay out to contractors, this is what you're gonna to have to do in order to ensure affirmative action compliance and hiring. That has to happen ahead and the investment in OFCCP and the EEOC assures that we can have that take place so we don't repeat the 1950s when those jobs to build the highways and the bridges didn't come to us. And it's so important to remember the majority of, um, of black workers are women. The majority of black workers are women. If you don't find ways to support women in the workplace, you hold back black labor. And so child care, pay for child care workers, investment in the jobs we do disproportionately, the care economy, which we know is holding back recovery. All of that means you're expanding the production possibilities of our country. How do you beat inflation? You increase the capacity of the country to produce goods. And you do that by having more workers having access to jobs and by increasing the infrastructure that lets businesses efficiently get workers, get information to customers, get product to customers. That's why this is not going to be inflationary. This will be the transformation we should have had you weren't supposed to add 4 million low-wage jobs to replace 4 million high-wage jobs. You were supposed to make the investments that created 4 million high-wage jobs. You don't replace sharecroppers with manufacturing workers as we did, right? That was low-wage to high-wage, and then turn around and say, now we're going to replace the manufacturing workers with sharecroppers. you got to keep adding high-wage jobs. That's what this does. Mr. Boyer, so given that it sounds like there's going to be a lot of work coming to the construction industry, and the, the question I have is, so what's going to be different? Because we know, speaking honestly, that there's been a long time struggle to desegregate the building trades. And so how do, you know, what's going to be different? You know, what, what do you see in terms of your own union and other building trades in terms of looking at the situation, looking at the possibilities and making sure that we really diversify who are the beneficiaries of this work? Thank you, that's a good question. As a student of Malcolm X, I like one quote, the future belongs to those who prepare for it today. So what we did in the Philadelphia area is we put our money where our mouth is. We opened up a $30 million training facility where we can have pre-apprentice there so we can train them for the skills. I believe that we shouldn't put all the money in training through the community college network. Yes, they have a role, but I think union apprenticeship programs have a role. And the devil is in the details of the legislation and the policies that they write to make sure and have enforcement mechanisms to, to make us. Like we have to trust but verify. You asked earlier about what's going to be different. What's going to be different is that we are now at the table. If, if it wasn't for black voters in South Carolina, we don't have all this. And we have to leverage that. We have to be honest and bold enough to say, this is what we deserve. You're not giving us anything. Uh, secondly, it, we're not going to address the wealth gap unless we address the gap of equity. And we need to have some contractors and workers. It can't just be one or the other. It can't be we focus on the work end, but we don't participate on the equity side. So we need to understand and make sure that those contracts are debundled so they're small enough so smaller African-American companies have a real shot. So I think that in the construction trades, it will be different because the workforce is different. Demographic shifts in a big, in a big city, but we have to be prepared for it. We have to challenge the public school systems to put more uh, building and construction trades within the school system so people can understand the language, the, the nomenclature of construction. They can understand the work ethic. And those are things that we're trying to do through pre-apprenticeship programs so that we can get people ready to go into a full apprenticeship program within the building trades. Thank you on that. Um, Congressman, uh, I'm very concerned about what all this is going to mean when it gets down to the states. 
the state level, um, because this money is going to be made available for the states. And, and let me step on a few toes by saying I've been really unsettled around what's happened with the cutoff of unemployment benefits and with the idea that uh, that's been advanced, at least the way I understand it, the administration suggesting that, well, the states have the money, they should just use it. But there's no gun to their head that forces them to that to do that. So what do we do to make sure that states, when they get these resources, do something different that guarantees real racial equity? Um, well, when you said the states um, uh, messed up the money on the rent moratorium uh, assistance, uh, a lot of states, the money never left the state capital and it's still sitting there. And um, tenants, uh, without the protection of the moratorium, are just left vulnerable. So you're absolutely right. One of the things we're we're putting in the child care, where it goes through the states, um, is if the state doesn't participate, uh, localities can participate. Uh, we saw this. Uh, we um, had this problem with the Medicaid expansion. Most states on Medicaid, with a 90% federal match. Um, um, most states, if they expand Medicaid, would actually make a profit. The taxes they get, and the the covered, the things they're covering with state dollars now covered with federal money. Um, uh, they would actually make a profit expanding Medicaid, cover hundreds of thousands of citizens, and they won't do it. And so, yes, we're we're looking at um, if a state isn't going to participate in the child care program, um, we're going to have a provision so that um, if Alabama doesn't want to do it, the city of Birmingham. Uh, can set up a program and get it done. And President Johnson, what do you think that this means for the work of NAACP chapters around the country to make sure that what we don't have is what the Congressman described, a money sitting in the state capitol uh, collecting interest uh, while people are suffering? What, what do we do to make sure that this money gets spent the way it needs to be spent and that there's real racial equity? Well, elections have consequences. So when you have some jurisdictions who are willing to uh, empower their citizens, support the uh, health and wealth of their citizens, you have others who would deny that opportunity. And so that's part of the advocacy role of the NAACP, along with many other groups on a local level. Uh, you know, states have been calculating what they will support or not support based on their political interests and outcome. And that's unfortunate. It, it has less to do with uh, citizens across the country or in a particular jurisdictions is about their political aspirations. You take uh, the state of Florida or for that matter, state of Texas, uh, where there's much opportunity for them to do right by their citizens. Uh, they're seeking ways to undermine success of this administration because they want to score political points, whether there's aspirations to run for president or what, uh, what other interests they may have. And so for NAACP, along with many groups on the ground, uh, the jurisdictions that uh, we live in, those are the areas we must advocate harder to ensure that if money come in or if they can access money out of the packages that have been adopted or the packages that, that will hopefully get adopted to make sure it get to the needs. Uh, and that's, that's the real game here. Fortunately, we have smartened from what happened with the Affordable Care Act and other provisions when it get to uh, deep red states where governors try to uh, uh, impede progress and it can go directly to local jurisdictions. Now it's time to make sure the local jurisdictions uh, do right by their citizens. And Vice President Brown, uh, in light of what we're looking at, um, is organized labor ready to really leap at this opportunity? Uh, I, I, I'm thinking about, you know, all too often, uh, many traditional unions uh, look at a situation and say, well, are these jobs unionized? Well, no, they're not. They're non-union and they got to get unionized. So the question is, do you think, is the union movement ready to address this? Or do you think that people are just like sitting on their hands? I would say we've been ready. You know, we quite literally the labor movement has been ready. Um, you know, Robin in her lead in, she talked about the fact that um, there's a whole new era of jobs that are going to be ushered in with this, hopefully, these two new bills. It's a brand new economy. 
We're talking about jobs in the renewable sector, you know, making wind turbines, installing solar panels, making solar panels, um, jobs around energy efficiency, jobs making electric buses and other vehicles, jobs building out the entire, uh, you know, electric vehicle infrastructure across the country. These are jobs, to your, to your point, that are not yet organized, but we are ready as the labor movement, and we've been actively trying for quite some years. I'm sure Ryan can tell you some stories. I have other colleagues, so I see who are attendees who could probably tell you some stories. What we're facing as a movement is a very harshly antagonistic viewpoint from these new industries towards the labor movement. We're talking about environmental sustainability, right? That, that, that big $3.5 trillion bill is very much about environmental sustainability, but it has to be coupled with economic sustainability. And what that means is making sure that these jobs that are gonna be created are family sustaining and community sustaining. And so we are ready and we've been working. We can talk to you about organizing campaigns that we've had with some of these OEMs that have failed because they have taken on the tactics of some of the old companies, some of the steel companies and others, right? That some of us are familiar with, captive audience meetings and the like to keep labor out. They want these to be $12 an hour jobs. They don't want them to be family sustaining jobs that pay you know, $70,000 plus. And so that's why, and I think, I don't know if, if Bill, I don't know who mentioned it earlier, but that's why including the Protecting uh, the Rights to Organize Act in the American Jobs Plan was so key because President Biden was being very clear about the type of economy he wants to create, which is one that includes union jobs, and includes an economy that is going to sustain families. So, you know, we, we've, we've been ready and we've been doing our part to really try to make this happen. Um, but this is where I say our, our alliances are so important. We are so grateful that labor and the NAACP have such a close relationship. It's also important that we broaden those alliances out to those organizations that do have close relationships with a lot of these new and emerging industries so that they can understand and they can also put their pressure and say, listen, you're not gonna create these cheap jobs that, that Dr. Spriggs went through in, you know, in great detail. You're not gonna create these cheap jobs. If you're gonna come to the United States and you're gonna invest and you're gonna benefit because another part of this is tax policy, right? A lot of these companies benefit from our tax policy, which is our, which is our money. If you're gonna benefit from the American dollar, the American taxpayer dollar, then you have to make sure that what you're creating benefits the American taxpayer. And so um, we're ready and we've been ready. Well, well said, <laughs> and, and I couldn't agree more uh, with, us being ready in the labor movement to uh, take new members in. Uh, the Labor's International Union of North America, we have a very robust organizing staff and we're ready to take people in. And I agree that the, 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 the allegiances with new groups of activists on the environmental side is very important because as they talk progressive policy, we have to talk about being progressive for the people. They have to put their money where their mouth is. We can't make this low wage work. We have to make this high wage, union sustaining, family sustaining jobs. And I couldn't agree with you more. Dr. Spriggs, thinking about this, what are the demands that you think that the labor movement needs to advance to make sure that there is a equity, uh, you know, when, when the money starts flowing? Well, it's a shame that we couldn't get the Richard L. Trumka Pro Act passed before. This is vital that we restore balance in the ability of workers to have a voice. We saw that in 2020, firms that were unionized did not lose jobs at the rate of firms that were non-union. The non-union sector was decimated because one of the most important things that unions do is give a place where employers can talk to their workers 
and iron out how do you get through a difficult time? How do you make a transition when things get tough, whether it's trade or whether it's a pandemic? How do we respond and keep workers? You notice these companies that are screaming, we can't find workers are disproportionately non-union. They don't have the rubber stamp from other workers that that would be a good job. And as workers got kicked all over the place last year, it's always astounding that all these employers who just kicked everybody to the side and stepped on them are now saying, oh, but we love you, won't you come back? You gotta have a way to talk to your workers with respect that allows that to happen. We need the minimum wage to be raised. There has been pressure to get wages up because we finally broke the back of the ability of firms to exploit workers this downturn because many workers escaped the really highly hyper-segregated workforces and workplaces they were in, found new avenues for jobs for those parts of the economy that were expanding. But we have to ensure that that's the case for all workers. Thank goodness Congressman Scott is here. He's won the fight in the House on both the PRO Act and the Raise the Wage Act to make sure that wages would be on a path to $15 an hour. A lot of people think this is just the pandemic, but we have to remember there are a number of states, thanks to efforts throughout the nation by labor unions to support fights to get to $15 an hour. But that has to be key. We cannot sustain our economy by allowing the low wage path. We have to continue to see productivity increases and workers at the table with their bosses to discuss how do we split the pie up. We've been more productive. Where's our cut? Without workers at the table, we've seen the share that goes to workers drop over the last 40 years. That's not rocket science. It's simple. If you're not sitting there when they slice the pie, you don't get your slice. Nobody just gives it to you. And if we don't support the floor by raising the minimum wage, we continue to allow the low wage path and the exploitation of workers who find themselves in very difficult position. The employers who are screaming, I couldn't get somebody to work because their unemployment check was bigger than what I was paying them, never Imagine the indictment they were making of themselves. The fact that you're paying somebody less than they were given unemployment has nothing to do with the worker. It has everything to do with you, the employer. Those workers were living paycheck to paycheck. Even with the unemployment check, they were living paycheck to paycheck. And that's why the unemployment insurance benefits that were added did nothing, absolutely nothing, up to the return of workers to jobs. The problem these employers are having is that they've lost that captivity. Workers are finding new and better jobs. They're lining up for those jobs, but we have to make all jobs better jobs. And doing that means raise the minimum wage, ensure that Americans have the right to organize. So I wanna use that actually as a segue to look at this issue of the racial wealth gap. Um, you know, very often we hear uh, a rising tide raises all boats, and uh, and and the, and we're you know told that the various kinds of economic programs will improve everybody, but that doesn't take into account that some of us are trapped in the steerage part of those boats, and that we're not necessarily rising. Sometimes our boats are stuck to the mud. So in in looking at this situation, and I, and I want to start with you, President Johnson. Um, how, how do you see this project as tackling the racial wealth gap? Or are there additional efforts that have to be undertaken in order to address that? Absolutely additional efforts. So if you consider uh, what economists have said, uh, Bill can correct me, uh, the creative wealth is home ownership, property home ownership, and small business. And in order to own a home, you have to 
uh, be able to qualify. You can't qualify if your credit debt ratio is too high. And the student loan debt crisis have prevented a large segment of the African community from qualifying for a home or quality housing stock, one. Two, there has been ongoing intentionality to devalue black property and black communities and black neighborhoods. So even when we move into a Prince George's County or Oakland County, Michigan, or you name the suburb from the urban core that we thought was the, the where we can arrive, over 10, 15 years, we begin to see the property value of those homes not appreciate at the same level that they did prior to African Americans move in. So you have uh, 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 the lack of ability to qualify for home ownership, and then you have the devaluing of Black communities. Those two things there are uh, huge barriers to closing a wealth gap. Now, in terms of the credit piece, and I stay on this student loan debt crisis, what, ha what began to happen about 15, 17 years ago is state legislative bodies stop investing in their public universities and shifting the cost onto students by increasing tuition, require many students, first and second generation college goers to take out more loans. So there's been an explosion of student loans and it was during a time where you see an increased number of African-Americans going to college because we were told go to school, stay in school and then get a job. Well, the, it was a tipping point where going to school, staying in school, you were upside down in your in income opportunity because uh, the discriminatory practice in the private sector, we were not being hired at the same level. So we were going to the public sector work, which is good work, but our wage but earning potential was suppressed. And then we took out loans that could not, we could not sustain. So being a teacher is no longer a marketable uh, a profession in far too many communities. So you literally have teachers making forty, fifty thousand dollars, sixty in some rural communities, with eighty to one hundred twenty thousand dollars worth of student loan debt. Well, you can't address the student—I mean, the well crisis because those same teachers are hard pressed to qualify for homes or the housing stock they did qualify is subpar in black communities where the value of homes are out. That's not addressed in this bill, and we have to address that. There are a lot of good stuff in this bill. But you talk about closing the wealth gap, that's not addressed in this bill. Thank you for that. Congressman, uh, same question. Well, um, on the student loan debt, the reason it's not in here is that uh, we're right now in a deferment. So students haven't uh, paid on their student loans for about a year. The things we'd like to do in terms of uh, student loans, but frankly, they, they're all um, extremely expensive and they would have crowded out just about all the other investments that, that we had in this bill. The things we're trying to do, like eliminate the interest on student loans, uh, improve the discharge programs. They mentioned student loan, a student a public service loan forgiveness, uh, the uh, um, uh, discharge loan after you've made uh, payments based on a percentage of your income. Uh, so there, there are a number of programs that we sh should be able to improve the administration was taking advantage of um, uh, present law, the, what's called borrow defense. A lot of students were just ripped off in their um, education. Uh, they, they were defrauded, um, lied to, schools closed in the middle of their program. And under the Trump administration, they were given um, uh, no benefit. But under the um, Biden administration, tens of thousands of them have had um, significant loans uh, discharged in the billions of, it's gone into the billions of dollars. Uh, so we haven't um, forgotten that it's something we have to deal with, but we have to deal not with the present student loan uh, debt. If we discharge everybody's loan, spend trillions of dollars on that, we would not have changed anything for people who are signing up for college today. They're going to be in the same mess four years from now after they graduate, four or five years ago uh, when they graduate. As a people today, we have to uh, do something about reducing the uh, cost of, uh, of college uh, and making the loans easier, easier to pay off. 
prospectively, not just uh, for those that uh, have loans. And we also have to have other opportunities. Only about a third of the uh, students are going to, going to college. The other two thirds, uh, we have to have opportunities for them so that they can have um, the ability to make good, good payments. And that's where the unions come in. Um, uh, and we need to, to make sure that um, uh, the PRO Act, apprenticeships, and everything else uh, gets funded. The apprenticeships are a major part of the uh, job training opportunity. Also, um, I just want to point out that school construction is a major part of, um, uh, of the education and labor uh, jurisdiction, and that's um, going to receive, hopefully, we don't know, uh, tens of billions of dollars in school construction. Uh, those jobs are all good union jobs. You're talking about carpenters, electricians, um, um, painters, HVAC, uh, bricklayers. I mean, the, these are good uh, union jobs. You don't want them replaced by um, um, people who are not in unions. And, and so we want to make sure that those good union jobs, and we have provisions in there with Davis-Bacon and um, everything else to make sure the prevailing wage is, uh, is being paid. Uh, the, the union jobs did, uh, did not uh, become middle-class jobs by accident. Uh, the auto workers, the uh, postal workers, the, they, they got those jobs through hard-nosed negotiation um, and uh, very difficult organizing campaigns and converted uh, menial pay jobs to good middle-class jobs. And when uh, the president says the unions built the middle class, uh, that's what he's talking about, jobs that are paying a uh, good um, um, uh, middle-class wages. And we need to make sure that those opportunities are there, but we need to make sure that the jobs that are created, uh, like in school construction, are the jobs that, um, uh, in, in road building and others, uh, are jobs that good uh, uh, organized um, uh, unions can supply the workforce. And, and, and school construction, obviously it's there. So we just have a few minutes before we're going to go to questions. And I want to ask a question to the union wing of our panel, uh, beginning with you, uh, Vice President Brown, but ask uh, Dr. Spriggs and Mr. Boyer the same question. In, in 2009, um, when uh, the first year of the Obama administration, there was a lot of discussion about the Employee Free Choice Act uh, as a way of expanding union organizing and union membership. And I was completely underwhelmed by the approach that organized labor took of uh, essentially a lobbying campaign around this, but not connecting the right to organize to the biggest recession we had experienced in the depression. It was, it was as if these two things were happening in, in, in parallel universes. What I wanna know is right now, given we're coming out of what I think of as a minor depression of the last 18 months, we now have this possibility of building back better. How do we connect that with the right to organize, the PRO Act, et cetera? So I'd like each of you to speak briefly on how we make that connection in a way that rings for regular people. Vice President Brown. I would just say, I completely agree with you, Bill. You know, we, we ran a really big and significant campaign around, around the Employer Free Choice Act, and maybe we didn't connect all the dots. Right. Um, uh, but now it, it, it's 2021. Um, we've just gone through this significant economic depression um, that didn't just impact the entire economy. But and, and Dr. Spriggs, you know, you can speak more to this, but there is a whole new term that can't, that's come out of this period, the she session which is a recession for women because of all of the things that we've been talking about on this, on this call. Um, and I think doing that, you know, we, those of us in DC do a really terrible job of messaging the practical. We're talking about an economy that went through the ringer because of this pandemic. And really what we wanna do is bring jobs back create jobs, and make them sustain families. Bills like the PRO Act will do that. As jobs are being created because of bills like these two that we're talking about, we want to make sure that those jobs sustain families. And what will do that is the PRO Act. As simple as that. That's it. Cool. Mr. Boyer, same question. 
Yeah, I, I think uh, the principle that I like is keep it simple, stupid. Uh, you you make messaging for the local municipality and where is that? There is no national message. There's a Philadelphia message. There's a Prince George's County message. But at the end of it is their pocketbook. How does this affect me, the worker? If I join a union, I make more money, I get a pension, and I have a better life. And we have to make that as simple as build back better is. You join a union, you make more money, you live a better life, period, point blank, and make it easier for us to let you join the union so you can make more money, so that you can take care of your family, send your kids to college, everything that every American wants. And thank you. And Dr. Spears, you have the last word on this question before we go to the broader questions. I, I want to agree with what you just heard. I just want to remind people what President Johnson was talking about, the great migration from Black side of the South to the upper Midwest, to union jobs. We need to remind ourselves that Black union density, the share of Black workers who belong to unions, was significantly higher for Black workers than for white workers in the beginning of what we think of as sort of that golden age, that post-war era in 1946. Black workers have suffered the greatest decline in union density of any workers because those jobs in the upper Midwest that we went to were the creation of the black middle class as we understood it in Chicago, in Detroit. That was possible because as you just heard, union workers get paid more, they have pensions, they have health insurance. Black women, even today with our decline union density, a black woman is more likely to be a union member than a white man. I wanna say that again, because people have in their minds, a union member looks like Archie Bunker. A black woman is more likely to be a union member than a white man. This is where our community gets its middle class. But there's something else, and that is the destruction of American democracy that we saw in January. Unions are vital to democracy. This has to be restored the states that we all object to because they refuse to invest in their own people are the states where you have no unions, where you have no voice of workers in the political process to say to politicians, you need to invest in K through 12 education. You need to expand Medicaid. The states with the lowest union density invest the less than K through 12, have the shortest life expectancy, have the highest share of people who are not covered by public health or any other health insurance. The states that have the lowest union density have the highest incarceration rates. If you take the voice of people out of everyday politics, if you break their ability to organize, you break their voice, white union members, have attitudes towards black workers akin to turning off all white union workers into women. That's the transformation that we accomplish. White union workers' attitudes toward black workers is a major transformation of their attitude about equality. You don't transform, you can't just imagine that, oh, I'm gonna transform some working class person. You gotta transform the way they understand how does the economy work? That's what unions do. They protect American democracy. And in this moment, our democracy is in the biggest crisis it has ever been in. And so not just the issue of do we get higher paid workers, but do we even have a democracy to have this debate? So we, uh, are, I wanna uh, pose a final question to President Johnson and, and, and Congressman Scott. Um, I said earlier uh, that none of this happens based on magic. Uh, so if we're going to move 
and succeed in winning any of this, it's going to necessitate collective action, which our people have a long history in, although many people seem to have forgotten it, uh, particularly since the age of Reagan, uh, and seem to think that individual action is, is uh, what happens. But we're talking about collective action. So it would be useful if the two of you could offer a few words on what you believe people on the ground need to do in order to both win this whole program, but also make sure that there's real equity in what comes down. So I want to start with you, President Johnson. Great question, and thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank all the panel for joining us. This has been a very fertile uh, conversation, and I want to commend uh, Chairman Scott and members of the House for getting it right, that infrastructure is both uh, roads, bridges, buildings, but it's also people. Uh, and so the House did their job, and now it's up to the Senate. And then is, can we get a package that's negotiated? It will be something that, uh, like we have not seen before since the New Deal package and perhaps maybe the Great Society package, but it's huge. Uh, and in fact, it's on the, it, it has and will address many of the systemic issues. Uh, but it's my job to stay on message. And my message now is about student loan debt crisis. And that's where I'm going to continue to be because I see that as uh, one of the things that have crippled us. And it is about collective action. I, I've said some of you labor leaders here, pardon me, say, in my opinion, the greatest civil rights leader was Ethel Randolph. Why? Because he understood the power of workers. He organized workers. And because of that, workers was able to be the, the lifeblood, uh, whether they lived in Chicago, communicating with people in Mississippi or whether they lived in Alabama communicating with people in Pittsburgh, it, it, it's always about the workers because uh, that's where our power uh, continue to be. In a democracy, our, our, our vote is our currency and collectively when we cast our votes in the same bucket, uh, those elections have the consequence, cons consequences of positive outcome if we push in the right direction. And so collective action between now and the passage of this mega package is gonna be important. Uh, it was passed out of the house, but there's still much work to be done in the Senate. Um, and even when there is something that's agreed upon, it goes back to each body and still gonna need a push. Uh, and that push is gonna to have to be loud, clear uh, and focused. You know, whether it's around this Build Back Better package or uh, protecting our right to vote. Uh, it's going to take the collection, collective action of all. Uh, anytime that we fall into this egocentric approach to organizing and leadership, it fails us every time. But anytime, every time we've had a collective, a community centric collective approach, that's when we see the most success. So that's the charge. We have to do this together to build back black together and it's a collective act, active approach that we must take. Thank you, Congressman Scott. You have the final word before we take a couple of questions. Thank, thank, thank you, Bill. I think uh, the first thing you can people can do collectively is to vote. When people think their next election is at stake, they have a different attitude about how they address legislation. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'd like to see is to, for branches to invite their member of Congress to a branch meeting to report on what is going on in the, um, uh, in the legislation. Um, they, they would have to have, um, uh, they have to be prepared for certain answers. For example, what are you doing uh, on, on civil rights? They would like to say that, uh, oh, we put money into the EEOC and the Office of Federal Contracts and Compliance Programs to make sure that the uh, civil rights were, uh, were protected. Uh, that 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 money is you know that that's money is in, in in the package today may be gone tomorrow, but it'd be much less likely to go anywhere if people knew they're going to have to come up with an answer to the question what are you doing on civil rights? There are a lot of other little things in the bill that um, uh, like on uh, when you when you place the uh, pre-K programs, there's a provision that says you have to start in underserved areas. Um, I think that's an important uh, provision, and the education money, as I indicated, was um, is um, uh, distributed on the Title I formula. So it goes, and the school construction money, if it remains the way it is, will be distributed on Title I money, a Title I formula, so that the low-income areas 
will get the um, uh, most money. Uh, I think uh, what we've done with the HBCUs in the last uh, 12 months has been historic. Uh, usually we, um, uh, by formula, give out about $100 million, about a million dollars per HBCU, maybe in a good year, 200, 200 million. We have individual HBCUs that got $100 million in the last 12 months. Norfolk State got $100 million. Florida A&M got $100 million in debt relief in one bill uh, last December. So, I mean, there's a, there are a lot of things um, that we're doing. I think the total is usually about $100 million uh, to $200 million of $6.5 billion directly to HBCUs um, in, the last, um, in the last 12 months. And so I think we have a lot to talk about, but if uh, people know that they have to uh, report to an NAACP branch meeting, uh, they're much more likely to support these things so they would have something nice to say when they get there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanna thank all the panelists and uh, Dr. Riley, uh, you were gonna identify some questions from the audience. Absolutely, let me, so thank you all for your, your, your in-depth responses and really in-depth thought as we think about building back black and the opportunities that we have with uh, this current agenda and this current administration. You answered a lot of questions from the community today, um, but I have some particular ones that folks wanted um, content to, so I'll direct those. Um, so one question particularly maybe to uh, President Boyer and Vice President Brown, um, to your knowledge, and, and, and Congressman Scott, if you as well may have thoughts or content, but to your knowledge, does the bill require, as it's currently written, drafted, require bidders for contracts to have a certain number of jobs set aside for African Americans? Are there equity goals currently involved in the current legislation, or will that happen at the rollout? I think uh, federal legislation um, has some goals. Uh, it's not, I don't think it's hard fast, but it's always uh, minority participation goals, particularly when you're dealing with HUD, they have specific requirements for not only uh, African Americans and diverse, but they want people that live in public housing to participate in the construction of that. But I'm not uh, aware of any, you know, they only could be goals. I'm not a lawyer, but I think you can't have a hard fast rule. There must be, but I think there's always goals there. Absolutely. Go ahead, Congressman Scott. I'll defer to you. I'll go after you. <laughs> okay. Well, I think Ryan, Ryan is right on the law, but I think that's why we need uh, investments in, in the OFCCP, because that program requires affirmative action. Um, you, and if you don't have a, a, a meaningful affirmative action plan, they can go back and forth until you, in, until you do. And they have the opportunity to take to take you off the bidders list if you are not compliant. But if you don't have enough people to read the plans and actually understand what's going on, um, you can't you can't enforce that. That's why the investment in OFCCP uh, enforcement is so important. EEOC is a, is a lot uh, more direct, but you have to wait for a specific complaint. The power of the OFCCP is that. A, an affirmative action plan is required as a condition of participating in the federal program. And um, that has never been, since the Carter administration, uh, hasn't been uh, um, enforced the way it should be. With more money and more uh, personnel, uh, they can uh, beef that up and require those um, affirmative action programs to be meaningful. Yes, they, they can do it by making sure they are at the pre-bid process. So when bidders in each agency put forth a bid, they are already briefed. You're gonna to have to have an affirmative action plan. And key to fair employment is fair knowledge of a job. The Vietnam era Veterans Reemployment Act ensures that all of our veterans who have fought for our nation have a chance, the first chance at reemployment. And that takes place by ensuring that every state employment service knows when there's a federal contract. That means it must be publicly posted. Having enough people at the OFCCP means that they can make sure that everybody was given a fair shot at knowing the job was available and making sure that the bidders knew before they started the bidding that they were gonna to have to have an affirmative action plan. That's not the way it happens now because we haven't staffed them to the level 
to do the proper strategy, but the strategy is known, it works, and it makes a difference. The only other thing I'll say, and I'll speak quickly because I have a four-year-old who's run out of patience with me here in the back, um, is, is th this is going to lead to a lot of investment at the state level in terms of private projects too. And, and you know, one example is, is here in Maryland where I am up at the former Sparrows Point, Bethlehem Steel Sparrows Point facility, which is hallowed ground for our union because at one time it employed 50,000 steel workers many, 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 many years ago. Um, there's no more steel in the state of Maryland, uh, but U.S. Wind just broke ground on a project that's going to be called Sparrows Point Steel, and they will be fabricating um, monopiles for offshore wind. And we've worked with that company, so the, the people who are fabricating that steel will be steel workers. But when we went to that um, groundbreaking, there was a brother from the NAACP because the community was invited to participate in this event, to join in this event. And there was a brother from the NAACP and he came up to me afterward and he asked me, great that the steel workers are gonna get these jobs. How are you gonna make sure that black and brown people are gonna, are gonna get these jobs? So, you know, I think great. I think all of the things that Congressman Scott said and, 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 and Dr. Sprague said, I think are really important in terms of the programmatic things that exist. But I think it behooves us as well to be the ground troops ourselves when we see these projects are being developed and when they are, the ground is breaking on these things, to be there and ask the questions and be very pointed about what contractors they're gonna be using, what hiring practices they're going to be employing so that we then from our respective levels can try to see, you know, enact that change that we wanna see. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you for that, uh, President, Vice President Brown. Thank you for that. And I will say that in looking at the questions, it seems like we have, a lot of them were addressed, but I want everyone to know for the sake of time, we have noted all the questions and we'll make sure as we engage in developing future resources and we continue to, to work on this particular coalition and around this issue, we will make sure all your questions and your, 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 um, your needs are met and addressed moving forward. So we have, a, we have uh, before we, I, I guess before we move on, I just wanna thank you all again, um, President Johnson mentioned, but thank you all for engaging in a deep conversation and really shedding some proactive light on what we can do as we think about centering our communities and black workers in this monumental package. And so I hope everyone gained some insight and are ready to engage in this movement. And you will hear from the association soon moving forward. Um, to, to close us out, I'd like to uh, bring up on our virtual Zoom stage, um, uh, co-chair of the National Labor Committee and also president of the United Auto Workers, uh, Ray Curry, to give us some closing remarks. Good evening, everyone. Wow, what an informative exchange that just took place on the needs for advocacy, our economy, employment, and the disparity and wealth gaps that actually exist in all of our communities today. We need to make sure that we are continuously reaching out to our local unions, our state AFL-CIOs, and others to develop relationships. Not only that, as we saw tonight, we had our representative, Congressman Bobby Scott, join us. We need to know who our elected officials are. We need to make sure that we support them, and we need to make sure that we also visit the website that's attached to this event, which is Build Back Black. It's very important for all of us. Special thanks to President Johnson, our Chairman Leon Russell, and so many others who supported this event tonight. Without the extra efforts of Don Chase, Jamie Riley, and Robin Williams, this event would not be possible, along with so many who were in the background to facilitate the video production of this event. It's key for all of us to remember that our economy is driven when we have a voice and when we have economic empowerment in our communities. Also, this event would not have been possible without the great speakers that we had this evening. Again, President Johnson, Congressman Scott, United Steelworkers Vice President Roxanne Brown, Laborers International Representative Ryan Boyer, and our own AFL-CIO Chief Economist, Bill Springs. I wanna thank you all again for joining us tonight for this informative event we look forward to seeing you again later in the week as we continue our week in labor. Again, thank you and have a great evening.